Hello and welcome back to Food as Fuel, a series on the subject of food and the science of nutrition brought to you by the Institute for Optimum Nutrition. I'm Nicola Moore, a registered nutritional therapist and head of clinics at the Institute for over 10 years. Today we're going to begin the conversation about carbohydrates. This is a big subject so we're going to do it over two episodes. So a bit like with fats, carbohydrates have been subject to some confusion in recent years, whether we should actually be eating them or not. And this is because as people have started looking into things in more detail and understanding that fats aren't such a big problem that we thought they were, the attention has turned to carbohydrates instead. And this is because all carbohydrates, once they are absorbed, are broken down into sugar. And sugar seems to be the thing that's the problem for us. So it would be really good for us to explore what carbohydrates are because not all carbohydrates are created equally and there is certainly a role for particularly fibre which is part of carbohydrate in our diet. Um, so carbohydrates can be put into two camps, complex and simple. Now when you're thinking about different carbohydrates it's the complex ones that are the ones that are the most beneficial for us and complex means really they're added on to fiber. There is fiber contained within them as well versus simple, which is not having the fiber content and is considered something to be very quickly digested and not necessarily so beneficial for us. So complex carbohydrates are found in things like whole grains, but also in things like nuts and seeds, lentils, quinoa, and vegetables and fruits as well. The simple, or um, yeah, the simple carbohydrates are things like white bread, white pasta, uh, and white rice, things like that, but also the table sugar, the white sugar granules, or the things like the honeys, maple syrups, agave nectar, high fructose corn syrup, all of these things that are added into our food an awful lot to give it a flavor of sweetness, um, but that's not necessarily something that we want to be um, encouraging. It'd be really good for us to adapt our taste buds to some degree to not need that sweetness as much. Now the sugar molecule when it's broken down is broken down into two component parts glucose and fructose. Now glucose is the major fuel source for every cell in our body so glucose can be used everywhere to create energy. Fructose on the other hand really is only utilized and used in the liver. So it's not able to be um, used as effectively elsewhere. Now it's important to note that we can actually manufacture our own glucose from fat and protein foods and from our fat stores. So for this reason, you could say that carbohydrate as a macronutrient isn't an essential nutrient compared to things like fats and proteins in the diet. Because fats and proteins we can't manufacture, we have to obtain them from what we eat, but the carbohydrates we can actually make from our own reserves of fat. Now we don't need as much glucose as you might think in order to make energy. So our cells don't require huge, huge amounts and we tend to probably eat a little bit more carbohydrate than we actually need for our energy requirements. So when this happens, the glucose goes into our bloodstream and it's dealt with efficiently by a hormone called insulin. So the, the hormone insulin comes along and it helps us score this glucose into our cells where it can be used for energy but if it's got enough energy for time being, it will then convert it into fats and store it for, for later use. So this is why too many carbohydrates in the diet may actually lead to things like weight gain. Also, carbohydrates aren't that um, satisfying to eat in the long run. So you eat them and you feel a sudden burst of energy and, and satisfied for a short time, but quite quickly you might feel hungry again versus eating fats and proteins. Now what can happen if we have too many sugars coming into the blood on a regular basis ins and insulin is constantly being produced, over time our cells can become less receptive to the message of insulin and they might decide to not open up and allow the glucose in as they once did because they're saying I've got enough and I'm fed up of you keep telling me to bring this glucose into the cell. So at this point the blood sugar levels start to elevate um, to levels that aren't so helpful for health. 
Now this state is considered to be like a pre-diabetic state or something like metabolic syndrome when you start to notice weight gain around the middle potentially, um, higher blood pressure and some of the other um, health concerns that some of us face. Now fructose, remember, is the other molecule as part of, the, of the, the sugar molecule. And remember I said that fructose is only really metabolized and processed in the liver. So if you're eating lots and lots of sugar and we're consuming lots of fructose along with our glucose in that, in that sugar molecule, um, that fructose is going to go to the liver. Now it will be metabolized and it can be turned into glucose eventually too. But generally speaking, if we're eating high amounts of sugar, then there's too much for our liver to be able to process effectively. And again, our liver will convert it into fat as well in, instead. So this is when you might start to see things like fatty liver, which is something that we're seeing more and more frequently in a the population these days. Um, and something that's really linked to things like type two diabetes and other chronic health conditions. So I think the important thing to think about here is that it's not necessarily about you cannot have any sugar ever again. Of course, that's, that's possibly not um, a joyful way of looking at food and, and not a, a practical thing for you to consider doing, but it's about the balance again. It's about understanding how much added sugar is going into your meals and your food over the course of a day and a week. And what other foods are you eating instead to try and balance that out and to help you feel satisfied from your meals so that you're not then reaching for the sugary, quick, carbohydrate-based snacks in between. Okay, so what can we do practically about this? Well, there's three things to think about between now and next week. Number one, start looking at labels and start learning and understanding about whether you're eating more sugar than you actually realize. Anything that's a sugar is gonna be labeled as such, or it's gonna be labeled with a slightly different term, and it would normally end in three letters, O-S-E. For example, glucose, fructose, or lactose. Now, if these um, foods are in high quantities in a, pr in a product, it's going to be listed very high up in the list of ingredients. So if you see a sugar as um, one, two or three in the, in the list of ingredients, you know that that is a high sugar food. Another tip is that you can take the total number of grams of sugar in the product and divide it by four. By doing this, you get an approximation of the number of teaspoons of sugar in that food. Number two, there are other ways that sugars can sneak into our diet without us realizing it, even if we're trying to make healthy choices. So things like dried fruit, honey, and maple syrup, uh, things like agave nectar as well, they are all sources of sugar. So just because they have other benefits and they're not maybe, um, they have other things in them in addition to just sugar, they are still sugar. In your quest to be healthy, are you still eating quite a lot of sugar without you realizing it? And is there anything you can do to start reducing that down little by little to change your taste buds and not have such a desire for sweet foods? So number three, how could you practically start to work on reducing a sweet tooth? Well, the really best way to do that is to start looking at your meals in the first instance. Everything that we've spoken about already with the proteins and the fats is really relevant. And next time we're going to cover fiber, which is hugely, hugely helpful to understand about um, in terms of balancing your meals. Doing these things helps to keep you full for longer and is less likely to make you crave sweet foods later, especially if you can stick to that routine for two or three days. If you do want to have something sweet to eat, I'd suggest having it straight after a meal as a dessert and having something smaller, maybe some dark chocolate with some nuts or something so that you're getting some protein and fiber with that sugar. And if you're having it after a meal as well, it slows down the absorption of the sugars. So it makes it less of a problem in terms of a sudden bit hit, hit of blood glucose into the blood and the subsequent issues that you might have with insulin afterwards. So I hope you found that helpful. Next week, we're gonna continue talking about carbohydrates, specifically fiber, because fiber really is a very beneficial part of eating carbohydrates. So something we should definitely be doing. In the meantime, if you found this useful, please use the hashtag on social media, hashtag I-O-N, 
food as fuel and let us know what you think. Um, but I will look forward to seeing you again next time. Bye-bye.